Ball State hasn't seen someone with quite the scoring capability at Marcus Keene. We made a number of mistakes early. Their offense is, is hard to guard. Starting to see why the Central Michigan team is top 15 in the country in scoring. They went up about 10 and uh, we, we, we fought back. We knew that we could score on them. So I knew at halftime that we had a pretty, our momentum was kind of with us. second half is our pace got the best of them. That's when I remember the game starting to stretch out for us. It's been all ball seed as of late, getting it done offensively, but defensively as well. Trey Moses, the rejection at the rim, ball state by 13. As the game wore on and we got a few more reps and got a little more comfortable with, with the way they were running their stuff, we executed our, our plan better. more together team right now than we ever have been. Winning has become a bigger priority right now than it ever has been. Our practice, culture, and work ethic is much better right now than it ever has been, and I'm glad I'm not telling you this after two wins because I told you that before the Buffalo game. That's what championship teams have, and that's what we strive for. The central game was, you know, those type of games are team efforts. It's never just one guy shutting down Marcus Keen because he's using, you know, 50 pick and rolls a game. So there's 50 times when you're relying on multiple defenders. From a scouting standpoint, I feel like you treat them like you treat everybody else. You, uh, you research and figure out what they like to do and how they do it and try to take it away. You know, you got to be very um, aggressive with them on defense. You can't give them open shots. and. I just try to give it, uh, my best effort just to give them all contested looks. We watched him on film. We could tell like he can get his shot anytime he wants. I mean, he's a great one-on-one -on -one player. And the plan for us was just to make him take as many challenged shots as we could. He obviously started out the game like a firecracker. He was hot as can be. But I think over the course of the game, we did a pretty good job of doing that. And he ended up with uh, not his best percentage game. So from that standpoint, I thought we did a pretty good job. He's a really great player. Like you see, he's had a game where he scored 50 in conference and um, leads the nation in scoring. He's a really good player. I feel like we contained him for the most part. Over the course of the game, Taylor did a really good job of making it as hard as he could on him. And uh, you know, for the 40 minutes um, as, a, as a whole, he won that battle. Alec Peters, he's he's the real deal. That dude, I mean, he's putting up numbers, but his team's great, and he's winning every year. Every year, his team's top of the horizon league. He can post you up, and he can shoot threes. And we're just we're fortunate to have a guy like Franco when we play Valpo, because uh, 
Not many people have that type of defender that can defend in and out the way Franco can. He's just a problem in so many areas that, um, I mean, he's, he's just, he's hard to deal with. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Alex Peters, he's a real deal. I tell you what, Luke, he'd be another player out there for Ball State against this Eastern Michigan defense that they could certainly use with that 6'6", 206 pound frame. Kendon Crowder, buddy, starting to heat up, and the Cardinals need it. If Ball State's gonna win this game, I think he's gotta be out on the floor. I just never gave up. Like a lot of people told me I couldn't do things, and I feel like I can do anything I put my mind to. Like I played basketball, you know, like the parks. I didn't think I was that bad. I was, you know, five foot, you know, a little point guard. I was cut my uh, my junior year, sophomore year. I didn't really do anything, didn't try out anything. I just like being around the game, and so it took me like a month or two. I was like. I like basketball, you know, I just picked up, became a manager, and started doing what I had to do. I had really two options. I didn't want to go to school. I actually didn't want to go to college, but my mom told me it was either college or the military, and I didn't want to go to the military, so I said I had to go to college. So I just chose Ball State. I was the only one, didn't take a visit here, didn't look at any brochures, I just applied, and, and then my sophomore year was kind of where I you know, wanted to get more involved with basketball as, you know, the new recruits came in. So I went to try to talk to the coaches, and they was like, no, nah, we don't have any spots, but we have, you know, management positions open. I'm like, that's kind of cool, you know, what would I do? And they were just like, you probably be doing film, be on the court, you know, kind of gave me like the, the roles and duties of what they wanted me to do, and uh, I signed up, and that's when I started. We were at Butler University and uh, Coach Taylor was down some players. So since he was down, he was like, hey, do you want to, you know, get in a drill? Like, shots was going up and we had to rebound. I was getting a lot of rebounds, so, you know, the players obviously mad, like, man, why you going so hard? And the coaches, like, I didn't know they were shocked. I was just going out there and doing what they told me to do. I just played my role, and then next thing you know, the coach was like, you think about walking on? It was actually very weird. Like, the next day, I was a player, but I was still doing my manager duty. So I'd be dressed up in the basketball gear, everything, shoes, and I'd bring the balls out, you know, I'd bring towels out, and they like, hey, Katie, just, just know that you're a player now. Like, I couldn't, like, imagine that I was still, you know, a player on the team right then and there. I was just, I was still a manager. Who would have thought that Kenneth Crowder could possibly be the leading scorer? <laughs> And the Cardinals are in the game. Eastern Michigan's had an He'd gone from a guy that was a manager in high school to a guy that was playing in college basketball games. And I think all that happened when Billy Taylor was the coach. And then eventually he made the team as a walk-on. And when I showed up, he was on the team as a walk-on. To be honest, I thought he was going to kick me off the team. Because, uh, you know what I'm saying, like new coach, you can get new staff, new players and all that stuff. So I was just trying to do what I had to do just to kind of stay on the team. Every day I went out there and I just wanted to compete. Like, you got a spot, I was going to take it. Cause my end goal was to win and if, you know, we had Coach Whitford, I seen that he was a good coach. Uh, he knew what he was talking about, he knew the X and O's and how to get through a lot of stuff. So I just wanted to make everybody else better put us in a position to win. Well, he played a lot for us, you know, and, and he, he really actually helped us. When I left, I didn't really know what I wanted to do after I graduated, but I knew I wanted to be around the game. I was in the car and I kind of prayed, and I was just like, Lord, should I stay here in Chicago? Or should I go back to Ball State? You know, uh, like the next, you know, kind of like sign I get, that's the sign I would choose from. And right after I prayed, I got a phone call from Pierre Sneed. And he was out here in uh, Muncie, and he was just like, hey, bro, you trying to come back here? And I was just like, that's it, I'm going back. And so I just picked up everything, and I came back to Muncie. I hit up Coach Whiff, and I'm like, you got any you know, positions available that I can you know, actually help out the team? He was like, well, we got a GA spot open, but apparently it's closed because Juwan's in there. He got a year left. So you can come down here and just kind of work around, you know, Jaren and just, you know, pick up his duty, see if he need to help with anything, just kind of help him out as an office assistant. And then he, he talked about wanting to get into coaching, so we, he, he hung around for a year and kind of volunteered, and then the graduate manager spot became open, so we, we were fortunate to get him. We were excited about that because we knew who he was as a person, 
And um, when he, you know, kind of made that step to want to try to get into coaching, he, we knew, you know, when we had a GA opening that he would be the perfect guy. So far on the rhythm, I got a nice little groove right now. It's a lot tougher, you know, being in a different role. It's a lot of film exchange and, you know, digitally getting us organized for the people like me that don't know what they're doing. And then organizes all the managers who help run practice, help run the shooting programs, help run all that. So it's, uh, there's a lot on this plate. Like if next year somebody wanted me to be the head coach of a team, I wouldn't know what I was doing at the beginning, but eventually I'll mold myself and actually become, you know, you know, a guy that can lead a team or can lead, you know, to my championships, man, I just want to win. <laughs>we got to fix this and get this right or our season's not going to go the way we want it to. And we came together and I feel like we're like earning the right to play better. Good tempo early and a slam for Weber. I think Taylor's come a long way in terms of being able to run our team. Early in the year, he was more of a home run hitter, but he has a much better understanding of how to run our team on offense. The thing that makes him a special player is he's an emotional player. The thing I'll give him a lot of credit for this year is his ability to, to try to rein in his emotions at times. I love coaching him and I uh, love his passion and, and he's, he's, been, he's been great to have around this year. Taylor Persons knew all along where his shooters were running to the wing in the corner. I just feel like I've been more focused in practice and kind of understand what our team needs. Lately, I kind of have been chilled out a little bit. I don't know what happened. I just kind of, I guess, you know, just trying to understand that, you know, not to get too high on stuff, not to get too low on the plays. And it's kind of helped me out the way to talk to my teammates and the coaching staff. And I feel like it's made me a better player. This is Scott and Susan Hollywood, who had an interesting start to their relationship. I had an instant crush on her the minute that I saw her. One day I was walking out of the library and she looked at me and she said, hey, who are you going to win her ball with? And I told her, and then she got this smile on her face and she started to walk away and I said, wait, why did you ask? And she said, well, I was gonna ask you. So I told her, I said, wait here and she waited in the hallway and I walked back in and I told the other girl that I couldn't go with her and I walked back out and I said now you can ask me on February 7th 1998 Scott and Susan welcomed their only child Zach into their lives it didn't take long to latch on to his mom Anything that I ever wanted, I always went to my mom first. Zachary was definitely a mama's boy, so he could get away with a lot more from his mother than he could from me, certainly. <laughs> they only shipped one. At Bradley Bourbonnet Community High School, Zach played all four years on the varsity team and was cheered on by his biggest fan. 
There was times where my dad thought that she was going to get kicked out of the game. She was more fiery as a fan than my dad. After his senior season, Ball State took notice of Zach, and his mom was in full support. They knew that she was, she was going to be that mom that was always there at the games and being really loud. She told me, work as hard as you can. She told me that she loved me, and she told me she would see me in a month. I was texting her, and I asked her, like a question she told me to ask my dad because she wasn't feeling well. And I said, well, like, what, like, what does that mean? Like, why aren't, like, are you like really sick or are you like just have a cold? And she was like, she said that she was in the hospital getting IVs and stuff like that. And then like everything was fine. And then I called my dad and he said that she was back in the hospital again. And that's kind of when I realized like the, something really isn't right here. 20 years ago, Susan was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, an inflammatory bowel disease that causes complications to her colon. To this point, none of her flare-ups had been severe. It's an input-output disease, so as you eat, obviously you digest what you eat, and that's when you start to have problems. So what she would do is, is she would minimize the intake because then the output, there isn't as much problem. Well, when you do that, you lose a lot of weight. What happens is, is then you start to get compliments based upon how you're looking when you're actually doing the reverse of what you should be doing. I had two family members that were coming over and sitting with her at different times of the day as I worked. I got a call from that family member that had been sitting with her that day. She told me that Susie wasn't doing very good that day and her mindset wasn't, wasn't where it should be. I decided to come home from work right away when I heard that. I looked at her twin sister first and her twin sister shook her head no. And then I looked at my wife and I never saw that look on her face once in 32 years. I said, what's wrong? And she told me that she thought she was dying. I walked into the emergency room and my aunt came up to me and said like, you can go in there if you want, just like be prepared. I'm thinking like, you know, what does that mean? Like that's my mom in there. She could communicate with her eyes really well and like with her hands. And so she kept like looking at me and my dad and we we're like, like, what do you want? And she went like this and we we're like, do you want to, do you want to like write us something? So we got her a piece of paper and she just started writing stuff. And she wrote to me something that she always told me that dad loves you as much as I love you. I went into a room, the most beautiful room in the hospital. And it's a room that oversees the skyline of Chicago. And they sat down and they explained to me what they felt they needed to do for her. And it was, um, five surgeries and going through the progression of them telling me everything that needed to be done I got to the point where I just simply asked one question every time what's their chance of survival and by the time you got to the third surgery it was next to nothing I came home and I saw him crying in his bed and I just went up to him and just laid with him. That was the first time I saw my dad cry. That's really the moment that hit me that there's a lot going on and he doesn't know how to fix it and he he knows that there's a real problem here. I had had a very, very personal conversation with her about letting her know that it was okay. And then I went and told Zachary. 
he said to me like really softly, he said, you need to go in there because it's time. And so I went in there and I instantly grabbed her hand and I didn't want to let go of it. For like five minutes, it was just me and her. I didn't say a word, I just sat there with her. I was just waiting for her to breathe again and her chest to go up again. And, you know, it never did. I went up and gave my mom a kiss, just like we had did when I was little before I went to bed and told her that I loved her. In the hospital, I talked to my mom and I talked to her about what I want to major in. And I asked her if I would be a good teacher and she nodded her head yes. And I said, well, I'm thinking about um, becoming a special education teacher. And she nodded her head yes again. And that's when I really made the decision that that's what I was gonna pursue as my major. The person I connect with the most when I go back home is my high school head coach's son, Sam Renchen. Me and him, we always get ice cream together. We, like, we always play games. Like, uh, like Uno. Oh, draw four, Zach. That's me. <laughs> that draw oh, four, yeah. Zach. What's so all eat. He's so energetic. I was. And just wild. And I love it. Yo. Mm. Oh, you did, you did not do that. <laughs> Two, three. Got it. Got it, Zach? Yeah. Look at that. It's a fast Yeah, don't be jealous about me. Everyone has their problems and everyone has battles that people fight within themselves that they might not tell anyone. When I feel pain, I just think about all the pain that my mom felt and how much she still fought to try to make it through it. And there's no pain that I can feel that I can't push myself through. I just feel her presence with me all the time and I know she's up there watching me. I just use that as motivation that I'm just trying to make her proud. It's the Toledo Rockets in town at 4-4 four and four in the Mid-American Conference. Looking up, one game behind Ball State in the MAC West standings. Kanapke to the rim for Toledo. A two-hand slam for the 6'11 freshman. The replacement for Jonathan Williams gives Toledo a 5-0 lead. They just got punched in the mouth by Toledo. Ball State being exploited early here in the first half. You know, I think Franco and Taylor in particular, those guys, they weren't going to let us lose that game. The thing that impressed me the most about Taylor in that game was his maturity during the course of the game. His communicating to his teammates, his coming to the timeouts and really maintaining his composure. This ball stayed out and running. Long lead pass to Teague. Two-hand dunk in transition. There aren't many big guys that can make that play. It's part of what makes him special. Moses faces up Kanapke, goes to work, Kanapke hits the deck, offensive foul call. Ball State looking to end it in regulation if Kiapwe can hit this free throw. Free throw is up and it is down. Even at the buzzer, he doesn't get it off. 
no shot for Toledo, and Ball State wins. Being able to uh, pull off a win when, when you don't really feel too great about it was, was definitely big in helping us keep our momentum going forward. You know, we just got to keep getting better, and it's you know, one of the things that I know is coming that people will interpret however they interpret is our February schedule is murderer's row. We needed to get off to a good start in conference, and fortunately we did, and you know what, our road is much harder, traveled, and you know what, we can lose some, that's fine. I hope we don't, but as long as we have the mindset of just getting better every day, then you, you know, the rest of it tends to take care of itself.